In several of our passages of scripture today, we find an analogy or a way of imagining that is connecting the life of creation, the life of the world, of nature, and God's work of redemption, of saving us. So today I'd like to pay particular attention to one of our passages, to our passage from the prophet Isaiah. So our very first uh, scripture passage, so if you look in your bulletin, I'll be making reference to that. So on verse 10, we see this image, all these images of nature. It says, for as rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, bring, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We see this image kind of a, of a cycle. It does not return. The rain and snow fall from the heaven and they return there after they have done their work of watering the earth, making it sprout and bring forth and give seed to the sower and bread for the eater. What's included here is from the very elements themselves of earth and water to life, to the bringing forth and sprouting to humans who are doing sowing and eating as a part of this natural life. But Isaiah continues, just, just like that image I just told you, so, the Lord is saying, shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So does the word of the Lord come down like rain or snow from heaven for a purpose, that it is to bring something about, it is to sustain and renew something like the rain and the snow do. Verse 12 uh, Isaiah writes, for you shall go out with joy and be led back in peace. There's this living cycle of going out and being led back. And the fruit of human life is this joy and this peace. But then he continues talking about how this fruit of joy and peace has to do with how humanity is connected to the whole of creation. It continues in verse 12 that the mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That as we are beholding the earth, that we are participating in it as in our beholding of it, that we are the fullest fruit of the world, the fullest expression of the world. That the material elements, the mountains, the hills, like the rain and the earth, the living things, the trees of the field, growing forth and sprouting, these are all joined up together and are raised up in our joy and praise. We are like the priests of all creation. We speak on behalf of the entire cosmos, giving its praise and thanksgiving to God. And this is the natural fruit of human life. This is what God purposed. Our joy and peace in praising God along with all of creation. Receiving the good things of creation and returning with thanksgiving. Now, you may say this sounds awfully idyllic, but when we consider, often, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, I don't know about you, but sometimes I envy them. <clears throat> Life seems pretty, pretty good. Because our life has problems, big problems. 
And often when we're looking at, out at nature, the lilies and the birds, we realize the problem is less out there than in here and in our midst. The problem is all too human. And so we may ask, what about how we've made such a mess of things? We don't have this peace. Instead, we have conflict and anger and resentment. We don't have joy, but we have misery. What about the mess that we have made of ourselves? What about sin? And here, we should move back a little bit earlier in our reading from Isaiah. Earlier on in this chapter 55, Isaiah addresses sin using similar kinds of images. He says, sin is like buying food that is not food. It's like laboring for things that don't satisfy aiming our desires at the wrong things. The problem is not that sin breaks some kind of rule. The problem is that it is not good for you. It disorders you. It messes you up. The not very natural metaphor that I would use as a professor a lot, that it's like driving... Uh, a, a manual transmission as if it's an automatic. It doesn't matter what you believe about it. The car will let you know there's a problem. <laughs> anyway. Um, ask your dad what the manual transmission is. All right. Um, so it's bad for you, right? Sin messes us up. And then Isaiah, the Lord through Isaiah calls, in verses 6 and 7, calls those who have gone astray. Says, turn away from those ways. Leave those ways of thinking behind. They're messed up ways of living. Messed up ways of thinking. Those ways and those thoughts lead to conflict and misery and destruction. And he says, instead... Return to God, for he will have mercy and pardon and heal. The problem is not that when we look out into the world, that the world, the natural world is messed up. The problem has to do with us, has to do with our ways, our thoughts, with our disorder that leads to destruction, our sickness that leads unto death. But we need to remember that these thoughts and these ways are not the only thoughts and ways in the world. Isaiah reminds us that God's ways and God's thoughts are different. So let's return to verse 8 from Isaiah. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And if we stop here, this simply says that we are not God, and our way of looking at the world is a mess. It's screwed up. But that's not the end, of it, and that's not the point. He continues, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven, this is why he talked about this at all. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and don't return there again until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word that comes down, my word that, uh, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth, it shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap your hands. And if singing hills and clapping trees wasn't weird enough, 
He says, instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, briars and thorns are what grows in the wilderness or in a ruin. That's the Old Testament image, a desolate place. This is, this is the only life that's in a dead place, briars and thorns. And this is different than the picture of flourishing life. And this is where we humans find ourselves in the midst of these briars and thorns. But the work of God in our midst is to turn these briars and thorns into the cypress and the myrtle. The cypress and the myrtle are both evergreen trees, very distinctive in the minds of these desert people, that these are trees that stay green all year long. Cypresses are tall, soft evergreen that have medicinal fruit, and the myr myrtles are more like a bush that have fragrant, fragrant flowers that perfumes were made from that signified divine generosity and peace. The Hebrew word for myrtle is where the, our name Esther comes from. So what's depicted here is life coming forth from a place of death and desolation and ruin. The God who created heaven and earth does not simply provide for the natural order and the life of the world, but does something more wonderful, something above our twisted ways and our twisted thoughts. He does the unimaginable, and he has mercy. He pardons, he restores, he mends what we have broken, he forgives our sins, he takes our rightful death and makes new life. So how does this happen? The way that he does this, as it's hinted at in Isaiah, is that he sends forth his word. And as we read in the Gospel of John, the word has become flesh in Jesus, the Son. And the Father also sends forth his spirit, and the work of the Son and the work of the Spirit, or as the Church Father Irenaeus calls, the two hands of the Father and his redemption of the world. So we read in Romans chapter 8 this morning that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Son sent in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. And we know this because the Spirit of God dwells in us. Paul says that our transformation is as wondrous as mm. cypress and myrtle from thorns and briars, as wondrous as the forgiveness of sins, as the resurrection of the dead. This is new life in us. And the spirit of him who created the heavens and the earth, who is the source of all life, who raised Jesus from the dead, now dwells in us and will give life to our mortal bodies. So let us set our minds on the things of this spirit. For then you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. Amen.